so um, I would actually be the um, the guy that is trying to put this into perspective and one of the 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 issues doing uh, a talk like this is that your background is so diverse. How many of you consider yourself like marketing experts or senior in marketing? Have some. How many would perceive yourself as a totally opposite? I have no clue. Right? So that's the gap we're trying to bridge right now. So for the marketing experts, I would say the next 20 minutes, sorry, drink a beer, and bear with me, right? Because I'll need to try to make this introduction instead of jumping right into marketing automation, I'll actually try to put it into perspective and say, why are we actually talking about marketing automation? What has actually happened in, within marketing the last 15 years? Because it can seem so obvious now when I can look at your faces that many of you are quite young. And I will try to go a little bit back and say how marketing worked just 15, 20 years ago because that just put the developer into perspective and why things like marketing um, automation is so interesting. So we actually have, as Crystal said, we have two guest speakers. We have May, uh, who is a former entrepreneur working in a, in a startup, now an advisor, who basically talk about the foundations of marketing uh, automation. You know, what is it actually should do? We've also asked her to give a quite critical view on this because it's also important that you consider, should I actually spend time and resources on this now when you're two person start up or what should I wait with? And then we have Kara from HubSpot, which I guess many of you know HubSpot as one of the main tools for marketing optimization, who will talk about classical use cases for marketing optimization. Um, so the uh, timetable is, I'll have an uh, introduction the next let's say 18, 20 minutes. Then Mai is going on, we have a break. And then after the break, Carol will come from HubSpot and we'll have a joint Q&A. And what's very important, and we actually tried it the last two sessions, is that we have a Q&A platform. So we will not take questions as we go, we'll take questions at the end. So any question you might have, just enter into this URL, I think there's uh, pages also up here where you can just see URL and enter whatever question you have and then we take it at the end and the most important of course the only reason why you're here we also have beers <laughs> right so I always said so let's try to put it into perspective uh, and now I again sound like a very old man right so let's go tw 20 years back well, you can say what happened in marketing from 75 to 95, honestly, not that much, right? In 75, we had, we had uh, TV, we had print, we had outdoor, whatever. But what has happened from 1999 to now, now, and I just took 1999, why? It's 20 years ago. And I said, who was the most best-selling artist? It was Ricky Martin. What was the best-selling PC game? Apparently this, a roller coasting tycoon, right? So a lot of that does also happen. And I'll actually try, anyone know this game? From the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the biggest selling in 99. So what I will try to do is to say, what has actually happened? And I think the, the easiest way to look at this is, imagine that you were a startup in 1999. And now you're a game startup. So you're a game startup in 99 that invented this fantastic uh, game and you want it out. Why would you sell it? Will you sell it at Steam? No, how, how many of you are at Steam? Or having a, a PlayStation or Xbox, right? So what would you do in 99? You know, you wouldn't sell it at Steam because it didn't really exist. We are, all had internet, or most, some had internet, but you couldn't download it, right? It was way too slow. So where did you buy it? You buy it at a, a local electronic store. You buy it at a fixed price. Where would you hear about this? most likely in game magazines, stuff like that. Did social media exist? No. My point with all this is that if you look the last 20 years, what has happened in the way you go to market from a startup is just so amazing. So again, it's hard to believe if you've only worked uh, with, with startups the last five years. But again, I think also Crystal said, how would you go to market this 20 years ago? It is just so different. 
And that these differences actually lay the foundation for why we're talking about marketing optimization. And who are for this? Uh, I know it's a cliche, but isn't it fun to look at the first uh, uh, office of Amazon 99? And we all think of Amazon, this big beast. And it was actually started 20, uh, what, 22 or 23 years old uh, ago, years ago. So when I teach at Copenhagen Business School, of course, we talk about go-to-market strategies and we try to make it very advanced so we can claim that it's very, very hard, right? But in real life, it should be, if you should be very, very simple, which I am, it's about marketing and sales. You know, and then, of course, you will say, no, it's great, it's not black and white, but just, let, just keep it that way. So when I'm the following, we will talk about marketing and sales. I would say, well, marketing here, my definition in the old way would be mass media, right? One too many. So that could be outdoor, it could be print, it could be TV, it could be radio. Yes, it could also be the internet, right? And the other one is, of course, the one-to-one, -one, where we say, hey, we try to sell this one-to-one. -one. It could be physical, it could be on the phone, etc. Right? Does it make sense? Again, very, very simple, and I know it's not right in, in the real world, but it's just for this simplicity. So we should actually ask ourselves when we talk about marketing optimization and go one step back. And why aren't we all using sales? So if you want to buy anything, why aren't we just employing a salesperson? Because a salesperson is in fact a perfect tool if they're good. And honestly, they're hard to find, let's be honest. But we could find a person that actually understands your needs. And when I understand your need, I can tailor a product exactly to you. So I could actually find out what is exact. Do you want this or do you want it in gray? Are you willing to pay this or that? Do you want to buy whatever? You know, that is a classic sales process. So any one of you, how many of you have worked with enterprise sales or B2B sales? Right? This is the old way, right? Put in a lot of leads up here, which you get by canvassing, or yeah, mainly canvassing. You put them in and hopefully you buy here and hopefully they buy again, right? That's the classic B2B uh, tool. And you can say, if salespeople were free, we would all use them, if we could get some good ones. That's at least my claim, right? Because the main problem with this is cost. You know, I don't know how many of you who calculate your custom acquisition cost in B2B, but it's really, really hard to, uh, to sell anything B2B with, with classic salespeople without ending in custom acquisition cost in thousands of kroner. Meaning, of course, that if I want to sell this one, most likely I should not employ salespeople because it's too expensive. So when are you employing salespeople? Most likely when you have a value that is really, really high, right? So you can actually afford this high acquisition cost, right? That's at least my very, very simple way of sales. Again, if you're selling something extremely expensive, like you are selling fighter jets to the Danish uh, army, Hey, honestly, do you care about your custom acquisition cost of this or that when you sell for 35 billion? No. If you're buying this in, in El Giganten, of course you will care. But then you could say, what, what's the problem with marketing in terms of the classic mass media way? And the problem is, what we found out is that mass media is fantastic for generating awareness. So if I want you to know about my new tool or my new product whatever it's actually really really great right and that when we talk mass media here is both pr it's also uh, paid media right so if i really want to launch something new and everyone in copenhagen should know about this right now of course you can argue whether i can afford it but mass media is great so mass media is great up here but you should ask yourself and there's many, been many studies on this you know, what convinced you to actually buy something or try something new? And typically involved other recommendations from friends or some personal selling or a combination. So where you are, where mass media has a problem is when you have sort of a complex decision process. So if any of you want to buy, I found this really cheesy picture of a sales guy. I don't know who's the sales guy here. Well, this or that, but they're both cheesy, um, right? But again, for many people, buying a car would be a complex decision process. You might know about the new Volvo in the ads or from the PR, but before you actually decide to buy it, 
most likely you had some questions, you know, you know, just how does it really feel? And maybe you can get some question answers, right? That's one. And then we're coming back to my old uh, example with the B2B. Because um, business to business uh, decision processes are often relatively complex. At least as soon as you buy something of a certain value, right? So if you want to buy, uh, what could that be? Furniture of a big organization, right? So you have a big uh, company here, you want to buy it. Hey, yes, maybe we have one person here that is sort of the decision maker, but we also have two or three or four more. Are they buying this because they saw a Facebook ad saying cheap uh, furniture? Most likely not, right? So in general, mass media is great for awareness. It's less effective down here, at least when you have complex decision making. So the traditional way of seeing sales and marketing has been, okay, uh, in the beginning of the funnel, let's try to generate a lot of awareness by mass media. And again, mass media is not only paid, it's also earned media like PR. And let's, if we can afford it, have salespeople down here. Salespeople in different ways, right? Both salespeople in the El Giganten way, but also salespeople actually going out and kicking in doors. I think that's the 10 minute wrap up of how marketing has been. And then the five minute version of what's changing now, I see three, di three major things that lay the foundation of marketing optimization. It's marketing segmentation, it's how we can measure it, and it's basically a trend from outbound to inbound marketing. So again, the good old days. What, what do I remember from living at home in a, in, a, in, a, in a suburbia Denmark, right? I remember this coming in. This is one of those free magazines come in the door, which are given to all homeowners in Denmark. And there you can read about some really, really nice things from the garden and all kind of thing with a lot of advertising. And that's basically market segmentation until 15 years ago. That was, hey, you should advertise in my magazine because we have this really, really niche audience of homeowners in Denmark. Or you should advertise in my TV program, Paradise Hotel, because we have all the young, right? And now we can laugh about it, but that's really the pitch if you work in the, the media department of one of those. And of course, then you can say, when even amateurs like me now online can create audience that are much more narrow, I just for fun just took on Facebook, and again, I'm just an amateur. You know, what could you do? You just like anyone of you, I guess, how many of you have created a Facebook ad, right? In the good old days, how many of you would create an ad for a nude? Not that many, right? You would hire an agency. So now you actually also did, did, uh, made this process more democratic because all of us, in good or bad, can do it because we're all amateurs, right? Which you can see online. Uh, but again, my point is, we're down to niche, niche segmentation. And again, this is the amateur attempt without any cookies, without any user profiles, whatever, what you really know, right? Because we all come back to Facebook and Google actually know so much more. But just in mind, we're going from segmentation that is that broad to segmentation that is this narrow. The second one is how you measure this. I'm not kidding. If you ran a big advertising campaign on TV 15 years ago, you have to consider whether you should spend one or two more million on actually measuring the effect. Because how do you actually measure the effect of a, of, of, of a countrywide TV campaign? In short, you can't. You can see you got more customers in the weeks after, but was that due to the TV campaign or was it just because you know, something happened in the economy? Was it because your competitor fucked up? You don't know. So what did you do? You hired Gallard or whatever who will call a lot of people and find out why have you heard about this company, etc., etc. What are you doing now? Again, we're coming back to the amateur. So the amateur is just creating Facebook ads, right? So in the good old days, you create one and maybe test that. Now you create 15 or 20 different ads. And which one of them is the most effective? Anyone who guess? This, this, or that? What? How many things is the left one? This one. How many things is this one? How many things is the middle one? How many things is the right one? It was actually the middle one. And it's really ugly, right? 
It's really ugly, but it works. The cool thing about the internet now is, of course, we can track it all the way, which Maya and the rest will talk about, about lead scoring or whatever, right? Not only can I target it to a specific group, I can match it with different, um, with different uh, ads, I can follow the different leads and find out how they behave and therefore track them and score them, in, uh, right? So again, it seems so obvious for us, it hasn't been. And the third one has then been, which VC have coined, the law of shitty click-throughs, right? Uh, so this is the first internet banner, right? Who had a click rate of 78%. I started my first online company in 2000, and there we have click rates 1 to 2, 3%. How many of you are running online magazines now? What is the click rate? 0. 0, 0 something. So the point is that we are more and more getting blind to marketing messages because we see so many of them. So this is a heat map, I think it was made by Jakob Nielsen, where basically seeing, you know, what are people looking for, right? Because we all, do you look out here, right? No, we are getting blind. So the whole point is that with all these marketing messages we all getting, well, on Facebook, whatever, a new channel tends to work because no one else is doing it. So the first one who do it advertising on Snapchat, fantastic. The first one who did advertising on YouTube, fantastic. Then you'll see the efficacy going down. And then that leads basically to the third major trend we're seeing is the, the, the focus more and more on inbound marketing, meaning that creating content that generate uh, um, interest from buyers, which you then get to some kind of funnel. And I'll not go too more on that because we have experts in the room that will talk more about that. But that's one of the major trends you see within the last five, 10 years where folks have been more and more. And then many of the startups I'm involved in, I see the same, where, where they're not abandoning the classic, uh, let's kick in doors, either with advertising or sales reps, but they're getting more and more focusing on the inbound aspect. Um, so this basically means that if you could do these things with the visibility, with the, the segmentation, and with the inbound marketing, combined what we will then discuss with, with uh, marketing organization, you actually have the opportunity to automate some of these processes so you can use marketing down the, down the funnel. And by marketing, I basically mean someone that doesn't involve a physical manual process, right? Because coming back to that was a process. We all like the sales people because they can be effective, but the cost is so high. You can't handle that with thousands of leads. But can you do that in an automated way that is, in my view, basically marketing automation, right? So when we talk about marketing automation here, we talk about these pieces of software that can help you automate some of these tasks. And they can be used together with inbound marketing, which, you know, for instance, HubSpot is a, is a big leader on that. But in general, you could also use it with classic uh, outbound marketing, right? So if you generate a lot of, of, of leads all the way, all the, your customer database, you can of course also fill them into some kind of cost of funnel for repeat sales. So I'll not take the meat out of that, I'll say, but, but just remember when we talk about marketing optimization, the software is maybe the smallest part. Because if you really want to do this, if you really want to be successful with such a strategy, let's say in by marketing, well, guess what? It says block. Who's writing that blog post? Who are doing all this, right? Just because you have the software to handle all these leads is not the same as you actually have the, the content in place. So with that being said, my point is that a lot of things have happening that now enable us to use these new tools. And it seems so obvious, but it was not obvious 15 years ago. And I see many startups, but also larger companies still experimenting with what can we actually do? How can we actually use this marketing organization? So that was sort of my intro. And now the, the, the experts can wake up again and drink a beer, because hopefully now we actually have someone that knows a lot about it. So I'd like to introduce my uh, talking about how you can lay the foundations of um, marketing organization. So give a hand to my. Okay, so we actually have, uh, you can feel free to stay. If you go to the next room, I think there's still a few beers to hang out and network a little bit. And otherwise, we we'll say thank you. And we have just a final comment here. And that is. Ooh.
move that very quickly. Blah, blah. We already talked about that. I'm very fast. <laughs> so, remember on March 5th, we actually had another Appreciate Academy event, this time on very specific on how to measure product market fit. Because both Precede and I, we are in the investment business and we always meet startups saying, we reach product market fit. And then we're in the discussion on how to measure that. So we actually have an event on that, March 5th, yeah. with more Precede Academy. In April 3rd and 4th, we almost go global, as global as we can go, we go to Aarhus. <laughs> uh, and we will have uh, a startup funding session in Copenhagen the 3rd and in 4th in, uh, in Aarhus. And finally, on March 6th, we have an open door event where you can sign up at Pre-Seed Academy uh, to get basically 30 minutes of uh, free feedback on your idea. So it's not a pitching event, it's more like a free feedback. And as already mentioned, um, the slides will be sent to you very early. And as soon as the video is ready, they'll also be sent out to you by link. I guess that's all? Yeah, the two events in March and April. The events are not out yet. The events so are not out yet, so calendar, be you should go to preseedacademy.com and we will score you and maybe you get know you're not qualified to participate and then you know we are, we are implemented HubSpot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.